We would like to have the meeting tonight. We can only do that if it calms down. That's fine. Attention. We we want to have this business meeting tonight. If we cannot remain, if we cannot have calm in the room, we will not be having our meeting tonight. We really want to have it. They're, they're opening it now. They're opening the blinds now. So I've said this three times. We're opening the blinds now. But if this continues outside, we cannot continue to have our business meeting. So if you guys would like us to have this meeting tonight, there needs to be calm in the room and calm outside. We, we no longer have an overflow room. Originally, we had an overflow room, and this was the section. Yes, you can see it's opened up. Can we, can we double check that the sound is outside? Jose, can you check on the sound and make sure it's going? Test, test. So they can hear outside. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This is the open session of our business meeting in attendance. We have the governing board, myself, Barbara Broche. Mrs. Han Sandy Hinkson, Mr. Stephen Lohner is re with us remotely, Mr. Stephen Schwartz, and Mr. Adam Skumowitz. We have our secretary to the board, Dr. Jody McClay, superintendent, 
This is Nicole Lash, Assistant Superintendent, Business Support Services. Dr. Karen Valdez, Assistant Superintendent, Educational Support Services. Mr. Frank Arce, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources Development. Ms. Kimberly Velez, Assistant Superintendent, Student Support Services. And Mrs. Sue O'Connell, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent. Mr. Schwartz will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We understand that many of you are here today to share your opinions regarding the wearing of masks, particularly by our students. Please know that neither the board nor staff have the authority to change the current mask mandates from the California Department of Public Health or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, requirements. We will not be voting on anything having to do with masks as it's not in our purview. Support for our opposition to masks should be directed to those authorizing agencies. We need, to, we need to conduct our meeting. <laughs> At approximately 9.30 p.m., the governing board will determine which of the remaining agenda items can be considered and acted upon prior to 10 p.m. and may continue all other items on which additional time is required until a future meeting. All meetings are scheduled to end by 10 p.m. Mrs. Kingston will now read out items that were in closed session for action. And It was moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Skumowitz to approve settlement for case number MCC 1900175. Motion carried by a vote of five to zero. It was also moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Skumowitz to approve the victim restitution settlement agreement as presented. The motion uh, carried by a vote of five to zero. The governing board welcomes public comments. This is the time for open session public comments. Public comments are allowed up to a maximum of three minutes per comment in the order received to a maximum total time of 30 minutes per item for comments on agenda items or non-agenda items. For consent agenda item topics, a limit of three minutes total will be allowed from one speaker. Unless the item has been placed on the published agenda in accordance with the Brown Act, there shall be, sh there shall be no action taken. No discussion will be made regarding personal issues in open session. All public comments are an important part of the board meeting and are given careful consideration by the governing board. So I know we have um, quite a few. Some of them will be done now and others will be done on the agenda item. First up, we have Caitlin Jones. Hi, Caitlin, you'll have 30 second. Uh, you'll have a 30 second warning. Oh, oh yeah, no, I'm sorry. You'll have a 30 second warning, um, and Mr. Skumowitz will let you know. Hello, my name is Steve Campos, and I am speaking as an individual teacher and just sharing my experience as an employee. I would like to start by saying that we need to stop the politicization of education. This is doing great harm to our students and is dividing us as Americans as well as a community. 
When I returned to in-person instruction, I was so excited to see my sixth grade teachers whom I had never met in person and also my seventh grade students whom I hadn't seen for over a year. Even though there was an eagerness and excitement for all of us who had decided to return to campus, I could see the impact or toll that the past year had taken upon our students. For many, it looked like the joy of life had been sucked out of them. They no longer had that joyful seventh grade smile on their face or the energetic hop in their step. And even if they did have a smile on their face, I could not see it. As a PE teacher, I had only one day to see my students because they had in-person PE only once a week. As a PE staff, we made the decision to make sure students were getting 20 minutes of walking, jogging, or running the one day that we saw them. They had options on how to use those 20 minutes, and we felt that this was a great opportunity for them to socialize and connect with their friends while having an opportunity to get some physical conditioning in at the same time. One of the sad things was that the students had to wear a mask outside and not being able to breathe the fresh air that the day had presented. Some of them wore them happily and without an issue, while others asked if they could take them down. Then there were the ones who had them down and then would put them back up when they would walk by me like if they were doing something wrong or if I was going to get them in trouble. This was very sad to me and the toughest part of my day to deal with. I could see their dilemma was being com was, oh, with being compliant and following the rules, which I appreciated and saw it as a sign of respect. But I could also see the struggle and the pain of wearing the mask was causing them in their eyes. Some of the best conditioned students I had had expressed to me how difficult and uncomfortable it was for them to run with their mask on. As you can see, inside I was torn to see this and yet I understood the fear factors and concerns some had and respected them. As we approach the opening of our next school year, I hope you're not having to work and live under the mandates that do not work for everyone. I know many have received the vaccine and many have built up antibodies from having been exposed to COVID and many are not vaccinated. I believe we as members of this community have enough information as parents, students, and TVUSD staff to make an informed decision of what we think is best for us as individuals and as a collective group. If people choose to wear a mask or shield, great. If people choose to not wear a mask, great. Our buildings are equipped with what we need to keep us safe. Our classrooms are stocked with masks, sanitation wipes, soaps, paper towels, and sprays to keep Thank us you. all safe. Time's up. Thank you. Next, we have Julie Madzirasek. Am I getting better at that, Julie? Close. <laughs> Adam, Mr. Skimmel, to let you know when your 30 seconds okay. timer is. Cultural proficiency, diversity, equity, and inclusion, ethnic studies, or in the case of this school district, equity, access, and inclusion are all ju just different names for the same subject. Critical race theory. We've been told that CRT is not being taught in our schools, but yet it is. The purpose of educators is to objectively impart knowledge. Instead, TVUSD has contra contracted the services of organizations like the Howard Group, Generation Ready, and Epic Education, who clearly focus on one race. The district has spent thousands of dollars providing professional development and training to administrators and staff on CRT. It is time that you stop taking the term social studies so literally and go back to teaching factually based history and civics. Several, <laughs> several meetings ago, the TVEA res representative talked about a video of a teacher from Temecula Valley that was recorded discussing white privilege and stated that teachers should be able to share their experiences to enhance the discussion. I disagree. Teachers should present facts and then moderate discussions, guide free thought without imparting bias. It is the job of parents to guide their children's moral and ethical compass, not the school. Hate is not natural. Hate is taught. By teaching CRT and its misguided agenda, you are teaching hate and that some are oppressors and others are victims. My skin is white, but I am mixed race and I am a person of color. I am a product of immigrant parents and I am first generation US born. I am a veteran, I am a patriot, and I will never apologize for the color of my skin. But when you teach such vile ideologies that focus on the color of one's skin rather than the content of their character, you are teaching hate and division. 
There are anti-bullying policies in place, but when you teach CRT, you are doing nothing but creating a new generation of bullies. Tonight, you will vote on the Master Assembly uh, consultant list, which is number two on the consent calendar. On that list, there is an organization called Epic Education. Their name sounds harmless, but they are very much not. Their online resources include videos with subtitles such as the permanence of racism and whiteness as property, among others. One of the opening quotes to the video, The Permanence of Racism, is, quote, racism is a permanent component of American life and racist hierarchical structures govern all political, economic, and social domains, including schools. That leaves very little doubt to, as to their bias. Leaders do not teach, leaders lead. They lead by example. Instead of teaching CRT, TVUSD should lead by example by ensuring there is equitable access and inclusion. Don't talk about it, do it. Don't teach tenets of division. Instead, teach the tenets of tolerance, unity, acceptance, and above all, kindness. Differences are what make this a great community. Differences should be embraced, not singled out. Do not spend another dollar on division and hate. Vote no to appro approve up. epic education on the master assembly Thank list you. of consultants. Thank you. Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson. I don't, I don't so much have a statement as much as I have questions. I'd like to know from each and every one of you, how many of you have students in the public school system here in TV? You don't have to answer that. Okay, think about it. The other thing I'd like to know is what is the science that you're using? What basis are you using in applying these mask mandates? I'd like to know that. I don't know if you can answer that now. That's it. That's all I want to know. We, we're at, oh, the, because sorry. of the Brown Act, we're not allowed to respond back to you. I'm sorry. We sorry. wish we could many times, but we're not allowed to. The other to. thing I'd like to say is my daughter will not be wearing a mask at Great Oak High School. And I'd like to know what the options are. And I'd like to think that while all these parents here are likely in the same position I am, that they're not going to be putting masks on their kid at school. And when you see that enrollment start to drop and the money starts to be sucked out of the school system, you're going to be singing a different tune. Next up, we have Tim Thompson. Well, hello, members of the board. I want to thank you uh, for practically nothing today. The way you've been handling yourself is a travesty to this entire community. I want to tell you that according to the Department of Health and Human Services, the COVID-19 virus has had an overall survivability rate of 99.8% globally, which increases to 99.97% for persons under the age of 70 on a par with the seasonal flu. If you don't understand this, you haven't been using that lump three feet above your rear end, okay? It's very simple. This is an attack on our culture. It's an attack on our children. It's an attack on our American way of life, and we will not put up with it. If you will not make a change, we will make a change with those seats that are right there, because you won't be in them anymore. I'll tell you this. I've been doing this for much longer than just COVID. I am no, no stranger to what goes on in the public school system. I want to fight what's going on, not just with the mask, but what's going on with the sexual indoctrination of our children. I come to the school board meetings, and what do you tell me? You tell me to go up to Sacramento because you don't have anything to, to do with this. Oh, we're, we're just a school board. Go to the state. So we go up to the state. I've done this dance so long. Go to the state. What do they tell us? Oh, well, you know what? You, you have to go back to your local school board because they're the ones with the control. So we come back to you. We don't have any control. This is what you guys do. You point the fingers in opposite directions. Nobody ever wants to take accountability. Those days are over with. Now, I'll tell you this. Here's what happened last time I was here. Steve Lohner was the only man with a backbone that was here that day. He said, I want us to at least have the conversation. Mr. Skumowitz, Mrs. Hinkson, and Mrs. Broach, 
All three of you are cowards and wouldn't even voice your opinion. You're cowards, and I'm not afraid to tell you. You're cowards, and you need to be replaced, okay? You have a, you have a moment to redeem yourself, though. Item M on your agenda today. You, you three, especially, need a vote to open the schools with no masks, no social distancing. This is enough is enough, and you need to make the decision to do what's right, okay? And I heard you, Mrs. Broch, I heard you say, hey, listen, you know, we... we we would voice our opinion, but we don't really think the state cares what we have to say. Even though superintendent said, seconds. you should go let your voice be heard. So if, if you're telling us to go let our voice be heard to the state, and you're saying the, the state doesn't even care what you have to say, do you see the hypocrisy of what's going on? Yeah. Enough of the hypocrisy. You three better make a stand for these parents in this community, and if you don't, you're being replaced. <laughs> Next, we have our consent calendar. All matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted with one vote. There are no discussion of consent calendar items unless members of the governing board or staff request that a specific items be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. I call for a motion and a second to approve by consent items one through 29 that were not pulled for separate action or tabled. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Mr. Skimmelitz. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Did you hear from Mr. I, I announced this before public comments started that there's an additional time for public comments on the reopening of schools. And if your name wasn't called. Yeah, you just moved it right. You don't count. I, that, Next up, our information report. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Arce, are you ready to... We need to get, as I said earlier, if the board cannot conduct their business, unfortunately, they will close the meeting. Please let us continue. We have, please let us continue. This cannot be an open forum. So I am always happy to answer your questions, but not during the business portion of the board meeting. Would you like to move on, Mrs. Grosch? Or are we closing? Announce the item and that you have public comments again. Mr. Arce, are you ready to announce our admin? Thank you. Good evening, President Broach and members of the board. I'm delighted to present to you some new members of our administrative team. We went through an extensive recruitment process with all of these positions and we're excited about the candidates that we bring forward as recommendations to the board today. Unfortunately, we had a couple who couldn't make it tonight and will hopefully be introduced at a next board meeting. I'd like to start off with our recommendation uh, for payroll supervisor. Uh, this is a new member to our management team uh, Miss Allison Bruce. <laughs> Miss Bruce has worked for TVUSD for the last seven years in the fiscal payroll department as a payroll specialist. 
She grew up in Santa Maria, California, the tri tip barbecue capital of the United States. Uh, she attended college at San Diego State University and University of Phoenix. She received her uh, BA in English from San Diego and an MA in elementary education and teaching credential from the University of Phoenix. She's been married to her husband, Russ, for 19 years, and they hope to travel somewhere exciting for their 20th anniversary uh, next year. She, she has two children. Ashton is 17 and will be a senior at Chaparral High School this fall. Paige is 15 and will be a sophomore at Chaparral High School this fall. Her favorite hobby is yoga. She loves to be active and yoga is great exercise and keeps her balanced. It's a great deal. It's a great way to deal with the stress of the day. I give you Allison Bruce. Hello, I'm Allison Bruce. I've been with TVUSD in the payroll department for the last seven years and I'm excited to be presented to you for the position of payroll supervisor. Um, I love this community. My children attend school within TVUSD and I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, I look forward to growing um, with the district and um, I feel like my background as a payroll specialist will be give me the knowledge that I need for the payroll supervisor position. Thank you. Next, board members, our recommendation for the position of elementary school assistant principal, one of our resource specialists, Ms. Sarah Gibbs. <laughs> Ms. Gibbs is in her ninth year in education. She's been in the district for all nine years teaching elementary general education and special education. She grew up in Temecula and she is a product of TVUSD. She actually attended Paloma Elementary Temecula Middle and Great Oak High School. She attended Northern, University, Northern Arizona University where she received a bachelor's degree in elementary and special education. She earned her master's in education teaching from California Baptist University and her administrative leadership credential from National University. She's recently married to her husband, Connor, who's a firefighter for the city of Riverside. So her name will soon be Sarah Frazier. Yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, she also bought a house in French Valley, and they're excited to move in and begin some renovations. In her free time, Sarah enjoys relaxing with the family, traveling, and reading. I give you Sarah Gibbs. Thank you very much. Good evening, Governing Board Members, Assistant Superintendent, and Superintendent McClay. I am so honored to have this opportunity to introduce myself as Sarah Gibbs, going to be Sarah Frazier, um, as Assistant Principal here in Temecula Valley Unified School District. Like Mr. Arce said, I grew up in Temecula, so I'm honored to continue to give back to my community and the district that I grew up in, and thank you all for this opportunity. Board members, next for the, our recommendation for the position of Assistant Director in Student Welfare and Success, Ms. Kelly Gradstein. <laughs> Ms. Gradstein was, ha, has been in education as a teacher for 10 years, elementary, general, and special education, and she started her teaching career with Teach for America in Atlanta, Georgia. She then taught in Detroit, Michigan before having her first son and returning home to work for TVUSD. She's been a principal for eight years, Paloma Elementary School and Barnett Elementary School. She grew up right here in Temecula. She started in TVUSD at Rancho Elementary when she was in fifth grade before moving on to Temecula Middle School, then Margarita Middle School when it opened, and Temecula Valley High School. She completed her undergraduate degree and earned her teaching credential from the University of the Pacific. She completed a master's degree in educational leadership at Wayne State University and completed a second master's degree in special education at Brandman. She's been married for 19 years with two sons. Sons are 16 and 13. Jackson is going to be a junior at TVHS this year and Maddox will be in eighth grade at Bella Vista Middle School. Her hobbies include she loves new recipes, she loves to cook, bake, and spend time with the family. I give you Kelly Gradstein. <laughs> 
Good evening, Executive Cabinet, Governing Board, and TVUSD community. Um, I just wanna say thank you so very much for this opportunity. When our family moved here in fifth grade, I never imagined uh, that we would come back and I would have my own two sons attending the very same school that I graduated from. Sorry, everybody, go Bears. Um, but it is a tremendous honor to be here today. I thank you for your support. I thank my family for their support, even though they're not here with me today. Um, I am very excited for this opportunity and thank you. Members of the board, coming to us from outside the district, our recommendation for the position of elementary school principal, Mr. Dustin Hackney. <laughs> Mr. Hackney has been in education for a total of 13 years, seven years as a secondary teacher, three years as an assistant principal, and three years as an elementary principal. He grew up in Beaumont, California, which is where he started his teaching career. He attended the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he got a BA in economics and math, he got a credential and master's in cross-cultural teaching from National University. He's been married for 10 years to his wife, Megan. She grew up in Temecula and went through Temecula schools. And they have two children. Harrison is seven and Stella is five. Both will be attending Temecula Valley schools this fall. His favorite hobbies are spending time with his kids, helping coach their various sports teams, and golfing. I give you Mr. Dustin Hackney. Good evening, Superintendent, Governing Board, and Assistant Superintendents. Um, I just want to thank you coming from outside the district. Work professionally, but being a member of this community, how excited I am to be a part of now Temecula Valley Unified School District. I'm excited to lead a school, lead a group of students and the staff um, as we help our students grow and move on to the next generation. So I thank you guys so much um, for the opportunity, and thank you very much. And finally, members of the board, members of the community, we have our, uh, one of our SCC teachers from Bell Elementary School for the position of Elementary Intervention Administrator. I'd like to introduce Ms. Taylor London. <laughs> this will be her eighth year in education. She grew up in a small mountain community of Tehachapi, California. She received her master's degree from Fresno Pacific University and a bachelor's degree from California State University, Bakersfield. She has a master's degree in administrative services and a bachelor's degree in liberal studies. She holds a credential in administrative services, a mild to moderate special education credential, and a multiple subject certificate. She's been married for five years. Uh, she has four children. Two stepsons are Colton, 15, and Jace, 13. And her children are Jackson, four, and Kaya, Kaya seven, seven months. Uh, they love to travel and camp in their fifth wheel anytime they can. I, give you Taylor London. I'd like to thank the superintendent, assist, assistant superintendents and the governing board to be here today. I'd also like to thank my husband for his constant support and my children. Um, this has been a goal that I've been working towards uh, since the start of my education career. Um, working for TVUSD as a teacher and now an administrator has been an incredible experience and I feel lucky to be a part of this district. It really is a home away from home and a place that I'm glad to call home. Um, I'm really for looking forward to making a positive impact on the lives of students, teachers, and everyone in this community. Um, I just want to thank you and um, let you know that I'm going to make you proud and appreciate your support. Members of the board and members of our community, that concludes our introduction of the new members to the administrative team. Let's give them one last round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Arce. We're moving into our information reports. Start with public comments on our first item, which is reopening schools. Stephanie Dawson. The SRDs are letting people in as people come out. I'm sure that Stephanie Dawson would like to start with her public comment if you guys can give her the floor. Let me go ahead. Yes. Mr. Skimowitz will give you your 30 seconds. Okay. 
I'm glad to be here to speak on this matter today. I think it's safe to say that, mask is that the mask issue has become quite political, but I ask that in this moment, in this room, we remove the politics and think about what's best for our children. Let us rewind for a minute and think back to March, April of last year. March, April of last year, COVID was a completely uncharted territory for us all, for children, parents, school districts, the government. When they told us we needed to shut down for two weeks to flatten the curve, we listened. When they told us not to come around people outside our households, stay home, isolate our children, and lock them down, we listened. When they told us that in order to protect others from asymptomatic spread, we had to cover our faces, and that of our children as young as two years old, we listened. Surge after surge, with a flow of inconsistent information from all lever levels, for over 12 months, we altered our everyday existence and that of our children. Our, ch our children taking a huge hit with canceled events, canceled milestones, losses in emotional development and losses of intellectual development. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it has been over a year and we have well over 12 months of data, COVID experience and moved goalposts. Our children deserve their lives back they deserve their normal back. So please consider this. It has been proven that for children, masking them can cause more harm than good. It has been proven that children are least likely to suffer from COVID. It has been proven that many of us parents are willing to pull our children from the district and take their education into our own hands. So I ask of you today to forget the politics, forget Sacramento, forget the unions, and do what's best for our children by making masks a choice and not a rule. And please know, defying Sacramento and other entities that claim authority over our children is an option. You have our parent backing to make the right choice for our kids so we can see their beautiful smiles and so they can breathe fresh air once again. Thank you. Next up, we have Karen Bram. Karen Bram. Karen heard it. Um, Mr. Skimelitz, we'll give you your 30 seconds. Okay. Hi, my name is Karen. I know that invalidates everything we say, right? Um, <laughs> If this meeting goes anything like other school boards in our state, there will be responses about how hands are tied. There will be blame shifting and instructions on how hope should be given to the same systems oppressing us. The AAP just released new guidelines that say anyone over two should be wearing masks. It doesn't matter which institution it is, Cal OSHA, et cetera, it'll be weaponized. But there's one institute that cannot be. It's called We the People. Yeah. Board members. Board members, we are not like the trapped and scared domestic violence victims anymore. We know gaslighting when we see it. We're saying there are no more excuses. Back when the majority party was voiding out my daughter's perfectly valid medical exemption, I asked our now senator, what's the point of fighting? We're always on the defense. Melinda said, well, if we don't fight, we lose faster. I love our senator, I do, but she's only right if we keep complying. We have more hope than just losing slowly, but the burden for that falls on the parents here. So I'm turning my attention away from you guys to the parents now. Losing slowly is our fate unless civil disobedience is our response to tyranny. It's time to teach your kids. It's time to teach your kids about civil disobedience. And it's time for you to engage in it too. The school board is not going to be able to change anything until you do. Either do whatever it takes to pull your kids out of this mess or teach them to refuse to comply. And as it applies to mass, know that the law is on your side. According to California Education Code section 48900, the school cannot send your kids home for not wearing masks. If if you're afraid for your kids to have to participate in that kind of behavior, that civil disobedience behavior, and you want them to learn how to respect adults, I get it, then pull them out. I'll help you. Find me. I'll help you. I get it. I was a single mom. I understand. It's hard to live in California on one income. You can do it. I'll help you. If, you've, if uh, you're saying that your only choice, your only option is to put them in school with masks on, that is not an option. That's called slavery. 
So do not comply with slavery. That's it. Elizabeth Reed. Elizabeth Reed. Elizabeth, Mr. Skidlowitz will give you your 30 seconds. Good evening, my name is Elizabeth Reed and I'm here to give a student's perspective and thoughts on going back to in-person school in August. The dialogue of the whole pandemic has become muddled over the past year. It started with a mantra, flatten the curve. The goal was to reduce cases in order to give hospitals time to adjust for the large amount of people now requiring care. However, the wording changed. People went from trying to reduce the massive case numbers to trying to prevent themselves from ever getting the virus. This is unrealistic. This propaganda is making people believe that they will never get the virus if they wear a mask and follow all the guidelines, which is ridiculous. Recently, there has been discussion among the TVSD district leaders of requiring all students returning to in-person school in August to wear a mask. I strongly disagree with this. The Riverside Department of Health only recommended that we continue to wear masks. It was never a mandate. I believe that every student should be able to choose whether to wear a mask or not. This is my body, and I should have the right to make my own choices regarding it. If I want to donate one of my kid kidneys or donate blood, I can make that choice. If I want to pierce my ears or dye my hair purple, I can also make that choice. I, for one, am really excited and looking forward to returning to school with the ability to choose for myself if I wear a mask or not. Students should also get the chance to be responsible and make that choice for themselves. If anybody here took their family on vacation during the summer, did you wear a mask? Did you have your children wear masks at the beach, in a restaurant, while visiting friends or family? It would be ludicrous to require us to continue wearing masks when a majority of TVUSD students have already been to multiple places around other people without a mask on. This pandemic can be classified as an exponential decay trend, meaning that over time, COVID cases decrease at exponential rates. Think about it like this. If COVID was a pie, say the first day you cut the pie in half and remove that half. The next day you cut that remaining half in half and only leave a quarter of the pie. And the day after that you do the same, only leaving an eighth of this COVID pie. That is how the pandemic works as, as it decreases exponentially. Mathematics clearly state that in an exponential decay graph, the Y value, which seconds. is the amount of COVID cases, will never ever reach zero. Even as X, or time in this case, moves off into infinity, Y will always be greater than zero, even if just by decimal. So if you are waiting around for this endemic to go away, it is clear and proven by math that you will be waiting around for an infinite amount of time. <laughs> this endemic will be with us forever. It would be absurd to keep hiding away from it. Let the students go back to school confident that they have the ability to make the best choice for themselves, their health, and their mentality. Yes. Thank you. Tyler, I can't read your uh, last name. Dawson. Dawson. Thank you. Good evening. Um, looks like we all are here with really the same message. So, you know, I had a big spill, but realistically, I just want you guys to follow this data, follow the science, just like every parent here does. You guys are our educators. If you guys are not able to research and find that, you have the ability to not follow the state mandate. The state mandate says we should follow a bunch of shoulds and recommends. There's no shalls are required. Therefore, they are not required to wear their mask. You have the option to not be lazy. You have the option to go to the Riverside County Health Department and develop your own plan to prevent our kids from being exposed to potential carbon dioxide, to gum disease. There's a million scientific data points behind why our kids should not be in mass. And there is nothing but recommendations of why they should. So follow the science. Do your research. 
go to Riverside County Health Department. You can develop your own plan that will allow our students back into schools without masks and without the hazard that they pose. So if you guys need help, Tyler Dawson, by the way, call me. I do this for a living. My job is to research COVID. My job is to research safe mitigations and to, assess, uh, to assess or assist the epidemiologist. The state has it wrong. CDC's recommendations are not required to be followed, and therefore we need to come up with our own plan. Yeah, yeah. Do it for our kids. Thank you. Laura Kingman. I ask someone maybe to do that for me to the board members. Um, you can hand it to the officer and the officer will hand it out. Good evening, board members. Something we haven't talked about tonight is the Constitution. Yes. Something that we have in our back pocket is the law. I've drafted a resolution for you. Something that you can take as an actionable item from here on out. We the parents have been called to action. We are no longer sitting passively by allowing our elected officials to determine policy for our children without our input. The time is here to take an active role in our children's education at all levels, and we're not going away at all. We want to accomplish a shared goal, which I hope you all do, of returning local control back to our school districts, which you say you don't have. So you can do your job to act in the best interest of the community here that elected and hired you. Any school district which signs on to these new res restrictions is likely to face legal action, similar to the legal action right now facing the California Department of the Public Health, as these mandates are clearly unconstitutional. Since the CDPH is leaving the enforcement of the mask mandate up to each district, and they do leave it up to each district, we are calling you to action immediately to commit to our schools and giving our children every opportunity to return to normalcy in the classroom. The resolution you have, I also just emailed it to you, along with 40 other board members in neighboring school districts here in the Valley, all the way up to Corona Norco. They all have this same resolution. We are not messing around. We ask that you approve this resolution to advocate for parental choice for masking and vaccinating our children as well as ensure the mask requirements will not be used as punishment to coerce children to get vaccinated. Our children deserve a school year free from unscientific and punitive restrictions. As educational leaders in our community, it is your duty to provide that to them, the children. They desperately need seconds. your support. Thank you. Courtney Toledo. I'd be happy to email it out to everybody. Courtney, Mr. will give you your 30 seconds. I'm here on behalf of my school age children. I have a kindergartner and a second grader that will be starting school in the fall. Um, I'm here to advocate for choice, specifically mask, mask choice, but I'm also asking you to make a choice, to stop hiding behind the mandates, to stand up for our kids and make your voices heard along with us. I am tired of the silence the secrets. I am tired of not knowing what you're thinking. I'm going off script here, sorry. I'm asking you to contact the CDPH and ask them to give you the jurisdiction in our district to make the choice on masks. We need to take back the choice for the parents. I have a son. I've held him back. He's five. He's going to be six. He's going into kindergarten. I wanted him to be ready. I wanted him to be emotionally and developmentally ready for kindergarten. Now he gets to go with a mask. How is he gonna learn to read? He can't see his teacher's face. I've started, how is he gonna learn to read? 
How is he going to learn how to interact with his peers if he can't see their face? How is he going to be a member of the community with his, his development is, is being hindered? Sorry, again, going off script. My daughter survived distance learning. She did well. Her grades were great. She hates school now. She hated school. How is she going to get back in the classroom and reignite that passion with a mask on her face? Something to worry about, something to take off, something to put on, something to get in trouble for. How is she going to do that? I understand your hands are tied. Untie them. Help us. Speak up for our kids. We are tired of waiting. Mr. Schwartz, I have a question for you that I know you can't answer. You said that you can't exempt the kids. You have to deal with the kids that don't show up with masks. How are you going to deal with our kids? What kind of verbiage is that? That's in an email that I have. You're looking to deal with our kids? How about educate, protect, help them develop, not just deal with them. That's not your job. That's not the teacher's job. They shouldn't have to, to monitor mask usage. That's not their job. I I have more time. People are going to say, I have a choice to pull my kids. That's not a choice. They need school. They need community. They need to know that the world is bigger than just our home. I've taught preschool in our home for seven years to prepare them. They are ready to go into the world. It is not a choice to tell me to just keep them home. I have to work. They deserve an education in person with their friends. I can't afford private school. I can't sell a car. I can't sell a kidney. I, I can't do those things. But they still deserve to be in school with their peers. And to say that that's a choice, it's not a choice. It's not equal. It's not fair. They're not getting the same education as the kids in school if I pull them out because I don't want them to wear a mask. Thank you. Cheryl Williams. Uh, good evening. Um, I just want to quickly discuss just a couple of the dangers of masks in children. Uh, masks um, adversely affect respiratory physiology and function. Masks lower oxygen levels in the blood. Medical masks raise carbon dioxide levels in the blood. Um, they trap exhaled viral and other pathogens in the mouth inner space, increase viral infections, leading to an increase in the severity of disease if you become um, in contact with it. Um, cloth masks may increase the, ris the risk of contracting COVID and other respiratory infections. They also give you a false sense of security. Oh, I'm wearing a mask, so now I don't have to socially distance. Now I don't have to use my hand sanitizer. Gives you a false sense of security. Um, also, untrained and inappropriate management of face masks. Children do not know how to put on a face mask correctly and wear it all day and not touch their face. So they're contaminating other surfaces, then putting it back on their mask. This leads to all kinds of adverse reactions. Um, including bacteria and viruses and mold that can colonize in their masks. A recent study of children wearing masks for a six to eight hour period of time found 82 bacterial colonies and four mold colonies in their masks. This is far more dangerous for the lung infections that it can um, it create, is far more dangerous than COVID-19 itself. We have. <laughs> We have <clears throat> bacterial pneumonia is exploding all over the country in children. Um, masks prevent the development of herd immunity, which is the only way to prevent and end a pandemic. Um, children with asthma, autism, and other neurodevelopmental disorders are being discriminated against and harmed by mask mandates and lockdowns. And another thing that a lot of people aren't um, talking about is the emotional, mental, psychological effects of mass mandates and lockdowns on our children. Depression, anxiety, attempted suicide has skyrocketed in the last year in teens and young kids. Kids as young as 10 years old are committing suicide. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, my kids, last year when they did go back to school for a month, their, ch their, ki their friends would seconds. not talk to them. They were afraid to go near them because they thought that they were going to give them COVID. 
Um, the teen suicide rate in California, just in the year 2020, rose 24%, leading to 134 deaths compared to 23 deaths of COVID. The suicide rate in young girls rose 50%. This is terrifying to me. I have three daughters. Um, all this for a disease that is 99.7 survivable in kids under 18. Thank you. Insane. Thank you. Katina Haverlock. Katina. I'd like to start by saying what I don't want to hear. And I don't want to hear that you don't have power to make changes. That was your opening statement. Your opening statement was that you don't have power, that OSHA is making you do it, that the California Health District is making you do that, and that is bull. You do have power. You were elected to represent this. This is why you're here. You're here for us as parents, and you're here for our children. And so I don't want to be told that, take it up to San Francisco, take it to, I want you to take it to San Francisco, and this is what I want you to tell them. This is according to the Centers for Disease Control. Since the beginning of this pandemic, 385 children under the age of 18 have passed away, and that is tragic. Of those 385 children, all had a pre-existing medical condition, a serious one like leukemia. When you look at kids without pre-existing conditions, it's next to zero deaths. That is your fact. Let's look at facts and not fear. Now, conversely, in the 2019-2020 school year, 434 children died from influenza, and we weren't masking them up then. So I want you to look at the facts, and I want you to look at the science, and I want you to remember why you are sitting there. You are not sitting there for power. You are sitting there for our children. You are sitting there for us, and I want you to get out of these seats and get up to Sacramento and make the voices of your constituents heard. That's your job. Thank you. Austin Myers, Austin Myers. I appreciate you guys taking all the abuse. Um, my first board meeting, I'm not familiar with you guys. You guys aren't familiar with me, but I have a feeling we'll get familiar with each other. Um, I appreciate all the virtue signaling with your masks. I have a mask too in my pocket. The box I took this mask out of said that it does not protect you against viruses, okay? I did, a, I did a little number crunching, okay? So in 2017 to 2018 flu season, did we shut down schools? No. Did we wear masks? No. Okay, uh, let's fast forward to 2020. Did we shut down schools? Did we wear masks? Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, why did we do it? Well, in 2020, we had COVID-19, as everybody knows. I checked the CDC website, and I looked up the number of deaths of school-aged children, which is 5 to 17 years. And in all of the United States, there was 126 deaths between March 1st of 2020 to December 12th of 2020. Of those, 47% had very, like we heard about, leukemia, different comorbidities that contributed to their death, probably greater than that. Amazingly, at the same time, there was no influenza deaths. So let's go back to 2017. Why did I bring that up? Well, in 2017, there was an estimate on the CDC website of that flu season that there was a total of 528 deaths. That was, that's 330% greater chance of your child dying of influenza in 2017 and 2018 than from COVID, and yet we're all mass. So I wanna know, what are you guys doing to push back on Sacramento like we've heard? Are you writing letters? Are you calling? I'm a businessman. If I wanna get something done and someone's not acting, sometimes you have to push a little harder. Sometimes you have to call frequently. Push back a little bit. And basically, too, I wanted to go to the agenda point that someone brought up in the first public session about epic education and CRT. Why are we allowing this in our schools? It's a vile, communist, Marxist <laughs> agenda. I know, I went, I went to college. 
30 I, seconds. I, I endured Marxist professors, okay? And I just want to say it's, it's not acceptable in our schools, and I really hope you guys can light on and veto the $3,500 to Epic Education. Please do. Dana Giddy. We have a speaker. Let's let's give her the respect to speak. I like what they're saying. <laughs> I'm here to advocate for my son who is on an IEP. And I will let you know TVUSD has failed him miserably. <laughs> Nothing of these past 15 months has helped my student at all. Where you have in my IEP, in his IEP, stated the least restricted environment, young kids are not affected by this disease. We have heard the numbers, we've heard all that. The numbers, if any, are low, minuscule, but the negative impact of masks on their academic and social progress is high. My son, I asked him, I said, I'm going tonight, I don't know if I'm going to speak or not, what would you say? He says, Mom, I can't focus when I wear that thing. I can't breathe, I can't... I can't do what I need to do. So someone who has ADD, who already has learning disabilities, has this other restrictive environment on his face that prevents him from getting the instructions he needs. That is not okay with me. Individuals with Disability Education Act is a special education law that mandates regulation for students with disabilities to protect their rights as students and the rights as parents. That's why I'm here. This is my very first time ever doing anything like this, but forcing masks on students is de developmentally inappropriate. It impedes instructions and restricts valuable peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, students cannot tolerate wearing a mask due to physical limitations, sensory intolerances, and behavioral concerns. It completely interferes with their right to a free and appropriate public education. And I, I fully 100 believe that. Kids need to be kids. We need to get back to normalcy. We all grew up where schools were germs. We, it's, I was a kindergarten teacher. I was always sick. It's okay, I built up my immunity. I got over it. We will get over this. This is not, I've had two of my three sons have COVID. They were sick for a day and a half. We've had worse colds than that. So having these masks, um, I believe teachers will be taking valuable teaching instruction time to have to enforce these things because everybody's, what kid is going to keep it on, not lick holes in it like my son does, uh, pull it, and then all the germs are on their hands, going to their seconds. desks, going every, these masks or anything. And as it was brought up, I decided to bring from my husband's medical facility a box, hospital grade, and the number one warning on here states, this mask is not to be used for antimicrobial uh, protection, yep. for antiviral protection, or particulate filtration, and it does not eliminate or reduce the risk of contracting any disease or infection. <laughs> right? So, thank you. This mask is about as useless as the people I see driving in their car thank alone you. with their mask on. So, Three minutes On is it. up. Three minutes is up. Thank you. Time's up. Okay. Time's up. Thank you. But I also, as a past kindergarten teacher, mm -hmm. smiles. It's the most important thing. President Broach, formation. we have reached 30 minutes on this agendized uh, comments on this agendized topic.
Let me have. We, we cannot have a discussion on extending the. We can't have the discussion to vote to extend time if we cannot have order in this room. I have 10 uh, public comments left. I need a motion to extend the 30 minutes. I move that we extend the public comment time to accommodate the remaining 10 uh, comments that have been submitted. Thank you. And can I have a second? Second. I second. Second. Second to Mr. Gomez. All in favor say aye. 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 Mr. Loner. Motion passes 5-0. We'll continue on with the next 10 comments. After the last of the comments, we are going to take a short break before we move into the information report. David Ellis and Caleb. So hold that American flag up high. So my name's David. And this is my son, Caleb. He's seven years old. 99.98% survival rate of children between the ages of zero and 17 years old. Please take a moment and actually let that sink in. Where's the true science? And I'm not talking about the fear-mongering talking points that we hear every single day spewed by the mainstream media every minute to the kids on Nickelodeon, along with the critical race theory. Oh, yeah. Don't say it yet. <laughs> For the past two years, our children have suffered more than, more than COVID just from the restrictions that have been put in place. Children these days, they spend so much time on devices and censored social media. And I repeat, censored social media. Anybody wants to argue with me? It's obvious, come on. Our children, they lack basic communication skills. And now we're gonna take away their ability to actually communicate effectively by putting masks on them. They can't smile, they can't do anything. My son, this is what he does, he smiles. He's outgoing. I mean, let's be real here. A hundred percent of this is politically motivated. Yes. Our children, they play together nonstop outside of school, but somehow wearing a mask at school makes them safer. I repeat, 99.98% survival rate. Yes. Our society is all about instilling fear in our children. This isn't about safety. Why is my child scared all the time because he sees stuff on TV? My child doesn't, didn't look at people in races or anything like that until like the last few years. And let's be obvious, let's be real of what, it, what the real reason is. So do you care about, excuse me, Mr. Schwartz, we don't need email, okay? Do you care about the country? I mean, about their anxiety and their depression? Do you care about the low levels of oxygen in the bloodstream that's leading to major respiratory 30 issues? 30 seconds. I hope my son's gonna get a few minutes. Do you care about the suicide rate and the increase from this additional anxiety? So let me just tell you a quick little story, two seconds, it'll be a quick story. I saw a little girl, 10 years old, walking down the street wearing a mask, glued to her cell phone. Nobody, you know what? The mask wasn't the problem. It was the problem was, is she wasn't aware of her surroundings. Somebody could have come by and abducted her, taken her, putting her in a car and taken her away. This is the United States of America. Time's and up, our sir. freedoms are being taken away from us and we won't stand for it. And now I'm gonna give some time to my son, who's seven years old, Caleb Ellis. Go ahead, Caleb. Go. I seen a mask with plexiglass in front of me. I have no energy 
they let us breathe for three seconds outside, then I have to go back in and learn again. I can't see their facial expressions. I don't understand them. I can't hear them. I can't talk to them. I can't do anything with them. It's terrible. I feel like I might quit the school if they're going to do this the whole time. I don't know why they're doing this. It's not necessary. The masks don't do anything. They, all they are are things that are face-hugging monsters <laughs> that pretty much do nothing. <laughs> nothing. I want my freedom. I want my freedom. Thank you. That's seven years old. Next, we have Joy. There wasn't a last name. The first name, Joy. We're back. <laughs> I was at the last meeting, there was 10 of us moms, and um, we came back with our people, so. Way to go, Temecula, it's all I have to say. Way to go, Temecula. Good evening, yes. Um, there's an army of us, and we're not stopping after tonight, just so you know. We have many things to tackle, like CRT masks is first on the list here. Good evening, Madam President and members of the board. I would first like to thank Mr. Loner on the screen. Mr. Loner, thank you for fighting for us. Thank you. That is why we voted for you. Thank you so much for fighting for us. I love your stand for our freedoms, for doing exactly what we elected you for. It's so disappointing to see that you're alone in this. I know that you got up and spoke and the rest of your board members shut you down. We know that the rest of the board believes this matter of requiring masks is out of their hands, that they're supposedly powerless. However, the answer, that answer will not work for us. We need you to fight for our kids' right to choose. Please band together with other school boards and put the pressure on the CDPH. You have this whole town behind you. We will have your backs. Or, if you have to require the mask, do not enforce any type of punishment if the kids aren't wearing them. Find a loophole. Find one. Request mask choice. Please do something. We ask that you don't just blindly follow these arbitrary mandates that have zero basis in science or data. Respectfully, if you can't solve, help with, or even fight for our biggest concern for our kids at this time, then what are you here for? What are you here for? This is, this is our biggest concern, our biggest concern. And I worked on campaigns locally for public office people and, and all the people that get behind you, I know what it takes for you to sit where you're sitting, all the people behind you, all the money it took to get you to that seat and you can't support the biggest concern of your valley? Like, I, I don't understand, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, basically, I'll finish with this. I've, a, I've been a, out and about in this valley every day with my kids at gyms, public pools, grocery stores, the mall, church, four VBSs, parks, birthday parties, the list goes on. And literally, we never see children in mass in this town. Maybe one kid out of 100. You cannot tell me that this valley wants their kids in masks, Steve. We are the citizens of a free country. This is the United States of America. And lastly, my body, my choice. How does it work for them, but not us? Thank you. Lenny Paris. OK, got nothing written down, so I'm just going to speak my mind. Um, First and foremost, our uh, great governor, Supreme Leader Newsom, just about two hours ago decided to put a statement out and said, if we are all vaccinated, the kids don't need to wear a mask. If we're not vaccinated, so to me, that's the point of my thing here is narrative tonight. Everything here is a narrative. Masks are a narrative. Vaccines are a narrative. See. CRT, narrative. Everything's a narrative. 
you, I am a business owner in town here. I have some of my clients in this room. Um, I'm also coach. I'm a, I'm a football coach for 10 years. When I see my junior, my son, who's a junior in high school, last year when he was a sophomore, he was given the opportunity to go back to school for that last month and a half. And under the guidelines that you're basically saying tonight, what did he tell me? Dad, I'm not going to school. I'm not going to school if I have to wear a mask. That tells me everything. I'm not sure about everybody. I don't know what the numbers were as far as, you know, how many kids end up going to school for the last month and a half. But bottom line is choice. You guys have the authority. There's districts out there who are basically doing what we all want. It's all over the place, okay? So you have the choice, you have the authority, just listen to what we have to say. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple because there is a sign out there right now, and I didn't want to get angry with anybody, but there's a sign out there to run for office, for run for board. I was one of the first ones to put my name out there, and this is not a threat, but this is a promise. We are coming for you if we do not get our way. Bottom line, this is Temecula Valley. This is not Los Angeles. This is not San Francisco. This is not Sacramento. This is Riverside County. We have a sheriff who will sit right next to me and back everything that I say. Everything that I say. Thank you. Christina Parrott. Hello, my name is Christina Paris. Um, I'm here to represent my family and our kids. I currently have a son in, in high school here in Temecula who will be a junior. My kids went through Tony Tobin, Vail, TV. They've attended Trinity Lutheran, bases before and after care, kinder care, and all the town camps. The reason why that's necessary to know is that in all that time, my kids attended your district. They have brought home and were exposed to coxsackie, fevers, chicken pox, lice, rash, colds, and flus. I work full time and they brought everything home. They have never worn a mask. Uh, we moved from New Jersey. They had very incremental vaccines. We didn't go for any of the other ones. Like all parents, coaches, teachers, and students here, the reason for my taking, talking today is selfish. We are now moving into the third disruptive academic school year, and these kids are not making any progress. You, along with all those in power in the state of California, are denying them their deserved academics as citizens. You're blocking their go-forward decisions that are affecting college and their future and the use of penalties of masks. Why is the penalty about masks? My son hasn't had a lab science in two years. These kids are not prepared for standardized testing that you're requiring. And our parents immigrated to this country for their grandchildren and their children. They have a better education than our kids do years later. While 1,000 educators ran to the borders to teach, leaving the rest of our kids to your mercy to be punished, wearing masks and staying in lockdowns. Masks are not required in our home along with my husband and I are not enforcing your ruling for masks. The latest state guidance on masks revised on July 13, stating that masks are optional outdoors 
for school settings but are required indoors is at your power. They move the power down to the district. And how are we enforcing mask rules? That is not acceptable. This should be a choice. What do you mean by enforcing? What are you gonna do? What does that mean? Is that a threat? Our governor is now mandating vaccines. As of two hours, he just posted that the only way masks could come off is if he mand if it's a vaccine. We've, I mean, we've written to seconds. Sacramento and their response was not acceptable to the real health and safety of our children. The masks are pointless, they do more harm. There is long-term use of face masks posted. There's articles by the PERC that show this. If you want to take as much credit for implementing masks and pushing this agenda, then I hope you're going to be willing to take all the blame for any suicides and all the emotional toll this has taken on our kids. <laughs> we urge you to fight for our community and mask Time's up. choice. Thank you. Vaughn Palmer. Vaughn, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Hello, I'm Vaughn Palmer. I came to speak today because I don't like how our school is working these days. First of all, why do we need masks if you don't need to wear a mask in the store? Uh, me and my sister do karate, don't have to wear a mask there. Uh, that is my first question. Also, my little sister, she went into quarantine a few days before her birthday. It was when she was in kindergarten. I feel so bad for her because she had to almost start school like this. I think that all of this is terrible and ridiculous. Thank you. Ian Palmer. All right, so I just uh, was reading on your guys' own website that all attendees here must have masks on. It says it right in there. But I look around, and no one has a mask on. So are we enforcing those rules? I know you can't answer my question, but the point is it's, there's hypocrisy here. There's law enforcement officials walking around with no masks on that work for the county in here, in this room. I mean, you guys all look ridiculous up there with your masks on. So, thanks. Um, but seriously, it sounds like maybe who knows i don't know what you're all thinking maybe you're back there and you wish you didn't have to wear masks and all that stuff too but you seem to ha lack the courage to you're standing behind this mandates or rules and saying we can't do anything about it yet july 15th a couple days ago school officials are flouting updated state rules saying students will be allowed to re return to classroom with or without a mask this is in california it says these districts were in class all year they just don't believe ma they don't believe masks are needed to teach children said Tim Taylor, the executive director of Small School Districts Association. Anyway, you can read the article, but they're not gonna wear masks. They told Sacramento, we're not doing it. So you guys, if you need inspiration, it's right there. Be inspired, do the same thing. Quit standing behind these mandates. This can't be fun for you people, right? You're gonna have a meeting, this is my first one, but you guys are gonna have a group like this every month, staying late, and you have to get told how much we hate the mask. I'm sure you guys don't wanna to have to do this every month, right? So come on, work for what these, all these people want. 
is the same thing. It's probably the same thing you guys want. So just do your jobs and do it. We have Ava. Good evening. Um, I'm, my name's Ava, and I'm 14. Um, my family chose to homeschool two years ago, and I'm so glad we did. We didn't have to wear masks or sit behind pieces of plastic all day. Most of my friends are going to TV or Great Oak next year. It makes me feel so sad that knowing that, they, that my friends will have to cover their faces all day just to go to school. Masks make it so much harder to communicate, talk, and engage. How is a kid supposed to hear what the teacher is saying when their mouth is covered? And the science clearly demonstrates that face masks cause carbon dioxide rebreathing and hypercapnia. Child CO2 levels are much higher than adult CO2 levels. So when a child is breathing in their own CO2 for six or more hours a day, their CO2 level is going to increase much, much more than an adult. And the carbon dioxide toxicity symptoms can cause dim sight, reduced hearing, shortness of breath, mus muscle tremors, increased heart weight, increased blood pressure, sweating, drowsiness, dizziness, confusion, headache, and unconsciousness. For the sake of my friends and everyone else in school, unmask the schools. Yes. Thank you. Lizella. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board. I am here as a member of the community and a mother of two school-aged children, and I'm actually an alumni of the first graduating class at Chaparral High School. I am here supported by countless parents from your school district, many of whom I do not know, and some that are also close friends, teachers, nurses, staff in your district. As elected officials, I'm asking you to reconsider your mandated indoor mask policy for all children, and I'm gonna add staff, because teachers don't deserve to wear them either. The students cannot see their face. The nurses should not have to be wearing masks. Your staff should not have to wear masks. This needs to be with no restrictions, no vaccines, um, no plexiglass. You cannot, you cannot be in the back of a Spanish classroom with plexiglass trying to learn a foreign language. This is absurd. I'm not gonna get into the real science behind the mask because you know, you know the truth, we all do. These masks do more harm than good. They cover the faces of the children you're supposed to be protecting, which is how they communicate. Have you forgotten that? Is it, is it okay? This is how they learn, this is how they read. They trap bacteria, increasing opportunities for illness. If this is really about health and safety, why are you encouraging a practice that has been proven to make people more ill? I have heard firsthand from teachers how the mental wellness of their students has been negatively impacted because of the mandated mask wearing in their classrooms. These teachers are here and they are afraid to speak out. They are afraid for retaliation from you. We have heard you sit on the dais and say, my hands are tied. We've been paying attention behind the scenes. Just recently, President Broach commented in an email, despite what some news sources are inaccurately reporting, whether or not masks are required for students is not, in all caps, a local decision. I find this interesting as just last week Alpine Unified, La Grande Union, uh, Cold Spring Union School District in California, in our state, yes they are small districts, but they are still school districts speaking up against this. They are making masks optional for students. And this is based on an announcement made by the California Department of Public Health, which you say is leading you. And I hope, Superintendent McClay, that when you do your presentation for this item, that you note that, that it is in your jurisdiction. Parents are getting smarter, and we're paying attention to what's happening at the local school board level. And it doesn't just apply to masks. It also has to do with critical race theory. Even if you don't want to call it that, that's okay. We're actually pretty smart, and we can figure things out. Sex education, even though you don't call it that, we know it's in everything, and we're watching what's going on. We know that in 2022, three of you are going to be up for re-election. We know that two of you will be up for re-election the following year in 2024. This is your opportunity to do what's right, to stand up and set the president for your neighboring districts. We ask you as elected representatives that are here to represent the people in front of you to do your job. Otherwise, when it's time to vote, we might have to say, sorry, our hands are tied. <laughs> Yeah. 
I have one last public comment. It was the uh, last one that was turned in, but there's no name on it. Okay. Hi, my name is Madeline Santone. I'm going into fourth grade, and I have brothers going into fourth and second grade. Last year, okay. we're going to get you so it's closer. Last year, when we wore masks in school, I felt like I couldn't breathe, and it was hard to hear my friends and, I, and my teacher. I couldn't focus. It was wet and annoying. My ears hurt, and it was very awful. I want you to let us choose if we want to wear a mask or not. I want to be able to choose if I want to wear a mask, and I don't want to get yelled at if I don't have one on. I'm not afraid of COVID or getting sick. I'm afraid of wearing masks all year. I'm afraid that the world will never return to normal. Please let schools go back to normal this year, and don't make the teachers yell at us if we don't have to wear a mask. Hi, I'm Lila Howell. I believe that masks should not be required at schools. One, they make it hard to breathe. Two, they don't stop the spread of COVID-19. Three, we should have our own choice. In conclusion, wearing masks don't help. We, should, we shouldn't have to wear them if we don't want to. Did, did she have extra time? I just want to say one thing really quick. I'm sorry, we had to have this form filled out. I have to. I was too nervous to, to do a form that. because I didn't think I was going to have the guts to say anything, but there's just one thing I need to I'm say. I'm so sorry. I cannot, I cannot <laughs> write the ground out. The board will take a 15 minute This isn't break about ego, time. Steve Schwartz. Uh -huh. This isn't about. We're taking a 15 minute break. There's only six slides in this. Are we okay? There's just one turned on. Okay. Turned on. I don't need it. Okay. I'm fine. Can I start? All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know there's a lot of anticipation for this topic. So as we pull up screens, uh, board, you can also see uh, the screens within the room if those are helpful. So um, this really should be a celebratory moment uh, when we talk about reopening schools. We've been waiting for this opportunity uh, to talk about full-time instruction and reopening for the past 17 months. So what started, and we, we heard reference to that tonight, what started as what we thought was a three-week closure um, has been an incredibly long and often very, very frustrating journey as our society as a whole has navigated the unknowns of this pandemic. So we are excited uh, to be finally authorized to be reopening full time. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight and what, what that's going to look like. Um, enrollment at, at this moment is looking good. Our target this year is 26,200. As of today, we've reached 26,000. So that's actually above where we typically are the third week in July. So we are excited about that. I must say before we talk about uh, August 11th, which is our big day, um, we are really proud uh, to be one of the few districts uh, in our entire county to have offered part-time instruction learning since last March, um, as well as one of the first districts to open hubs, which you know we began last October for our most at-risk learners. And we're proud of the multiple programs that we've been running this summer for many of our students. I believe over 2,000 of our students have been participating either in person or virtual uh, TK through 12 in our summer school programs. We refer to them as the roomies and the zoomies, you know, because some of them have been coming in person and others have been participating online. So 
As you also know, Governing Board, we are launching our new TK through 8 Home Instead Innovation Academy. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, for those who opt to remain online. And as of today, we have enrolled nearly 350 students in that new program. And that program, as you know, is in addition to our existing secondary online program. So basically, come August 11th then in TVUSD, we will be offering the full gamut of TK through 12 online learning for all of our families who want or need that option. So if you go to the next slide, Mrs. O'Connell, I don't have the clicker. Oh, I do have it, I'm sorry. Oh, there you go, all right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody, uh, I know lots of folks watching from home as well as here in the audience, uh, but most importantly our governing board, that in TVUSD our primary focus remains on ensuring high quality teaching and learning, and that's regardless of the program that families choose to enroll in, so be it in person or virtual. Our mission is to support the teaching and the learning processes. So you've seen some of our teachers this evening, our support staff, our administrators. I truly believe we have the best, and I, I firmly believe that this mission to focus on high quality teaching and learning is really what has set our district apart um, for the past two decades, because we have a relentless, or the expression we like to use is dog on a bone uh, mentality when it comes to our focus on instruction. And we try really hard to keep distractions in the background so that our teachers, our principals, and our support staff can really focus on student learning. And so that's been a critical theme throughout TVUSD's history that we want, we want to get back to. We want to get away from all of these extraneous things that really don't have much to do with teaching and learning at all. Um, they are distractions. So here you see on the next slide, we wanna talk just a little bit about, let's see if I can get it. No, this one isn't working, Mrs. O'Connell. Thank you so much. So full-time in-person instruction. Um, basically, with high quality teaching and learning in mind, what does that mean? Our 27 school sites, and now we're up to 33 programs, they will all open their doors on August 11th. Our return to in-person education will look very different than when it what it looked like when we left in June, um, when social distancing and many other measures were required of us. In fact, it will look far more like what it looked like when we closed for the pandemic in March of 2020, and we really believe that's cause for celebration. So it's, it's heartbreaking um, when we are forced to focus on items again that take us away from teaching and learning um, and really continue to divide our community. So what does that full-time instruction uh, look like? What does school look like? We're basically talking all courses, full instruction, and resumed normal daily schedules will be up and running. So start of school to end of the school day with, and I hope that our students are excited to hear this part, recess, lunch, physical education, visual and performing arts, athletics, um, all of those things going on throughout the school day um, that looked like school in March of 2020. And that includes students playing together, students chatting and talking, students eating together, mask free, always outdoors. And we're working on, we're getting to the indoor piece. So hang with me for just a minute or two more. But like I said, physical education, visual and performing arts, athletics, co-curriculars, clubs, Everything that we have in place in TVOSD that connects kids, because we've always had as a priority that we connect kids to school. And for many kids, that's the extra activities. That might just be playing dodgeball at recess time. So we're really working hard to be sure that we have all those connections in place. And this is exciting. It should be exciting. It should be an exciting time. I got a taste of it when I was able to visit summer school just a few weeks ago, seeing the kids all over the campus running around, learning in class, learning and playing outside of class was really, really exciting and exhilarating. And so we really should be excited uh, to start that and to see that again on August 11th. In regard to masks, now bear with me here, please, okay? We'll get to it. In regard to masks, they are being required at this point by the California Department of Public Health, otherwise known as CDPH. Please let me emphasize that. CDPH is mandating masks for students, vaccinated or not, in grades TK, K, TK through 12 at all schools, public and private, in California. 
It's not a local decision. Again, hang with me, we're gonna get there. Meaning that part is not a decision that our school board or our administrative staff is able to change. That doesn't mean that we aren't advocating for what we hear our community asking for. It doesn't mean that we haven't been advocating since day one. And it doesn't mean that we aren't very, very frustrated at the mixed messages. And we heard some of our, even students talking about that tonight, the discrepancies between what's required of us in schools versus what we're allowed to do in public, at the mall, at the parks, the soccer games, et cetera, et cetera. So where are we, if I could finish. So where are we with the masks? I know we have some staff watching as well, so we just wanted to highlight this, and I appreciate those of you just being patient enough to let me get to the part I know you want to hear most, most desperately. Per OSHA right now, all employees must wear masks unless they're vaccinated. Per CDPH, all students in grades T K through 12, um, sorry, um, like I mentioned, have to wear the masks while indoors, but within hours of the original CDPH documents release, and I believe this is where the confusion is coming from, CDPH revised their language so that each school district can determine now how to enforce the mask wearing of students. So each district has been asked to develop a plan that will be, of what will be done, basically, how will that be enforced? To what degree will it be enforced? What will enforcement look like? Each district has been asked to develop that plan for when a student doesn't wear the mask. Now, while we don't have that plan yet of how it will be enforced, we are working on it. We're working daily with other districts. We're working almost hourly with legal counsel, and we're working with state lobbyists as well as our county health experts to develop what that's going to look like. In addition to that, coming out very, very soon, we have a survey coming out for all of our stakeholders. Again, remember we have 26,000 students. That means 26,000 parents times two or more in some cases. So we wanna be sure that we're hearing from all. So we have a survey coming out for our parents as well as our staff. I know we heard some people tonight advocating on behalf of our staff. Just like our parents, we have some staff who are very, very passionate about not wanting masks. We have some staff who are very, very passionate about the reverse. And so that survey will be coming out. I know that's not exactly what everybody wants to hear tonight, but it's, it's authentic, it's real, it's transparent, it's where we are with what we know today. That doesn't mean that it won't change again tomorrow or the next day, or even the next day. But with what we know today, that's where we are at. So we thank you again. It's been 17 months of that. Believe me, I know more than anyone else knows how frustrating that has been. It's been 17 months and we need a little more time. So for those of you. Please let Dr. McClay finish her report. Would you like me to keep going? Yes? It, yes. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. So what you'll see, and I know that some folks in this room are not interested in this, but I have had a lot of contact this week from folks who have asked throughout the district and governing board, if you are interested on this next slide, Mrs. O'Connell, it just tells who to contact if you really are passionate, which I know. I would strongly suggest that we all continue to make our voices heard. This is critical that we continue to make our voices heard just like we are doing on our community's behalf. This will help. And so the last. I think you should push through so that. Pardon, I'm sorry. Get, let's get the information out and then we can reassess. Yes, it will be posted on the district website and we continue to give it to anybody who asks for it. And then last, Mrs. O'Connell. Would you do one more? So. so again, despite the mask issue right now being such a hot topic, be it political or be it personal for all of us, we want to emphasize that come August 11th, our focus is on 
high quality teaching and learning, be it in person or virtual. We will, we will focus on that and leave the other items to the experts who deal with those areas. So, thank you. Our next information report is board planning. This is the. This is the only last warning. If not, you'll have to be removed from the boardroom. We need to get through our business meeting. I know that there's a lot of, of passion here. I understand that, but we have to get through this meeting and there's other things in here we have to do for the kids for the next year. Board planning calendar and governance calendar. Okay, do you want me Sorry. to start or you want to start? Go ahead, Mrs. Hickson, and I'll tag on. Okay. So each year, um, this time we reevaluate our um, board planning calendar. And in front of you, you have a couple different documents. The first one is the board planning calendar. And when we were looking at this for this year, um, we did a look back really at two years because last year our reports were basically modified because we were, you know, in a different mode with. Um, online learning. So some of our reports shifted, some of them we chose to postpone. And so we really took a look back two years to make sure that we were revisiting topics that are important for the board to be informed on. So with that in mind, um, if you look at the board planning calendar um, and also the handout that was given to you that says study session and workshop topics for 2021-22, for each, for each month that we have two board meetings, um, for the first board meeting, we um, have a study topic or study session. And so our, we attempt to have just one topic that is addressed for board reports during that month. And you'll notice at the bottom it says that when we have a uh, study, uh, I'm sorry, when we have a study session, that one topic is 30 minutes. On the second meeting of the month, we have multiple topics. Each topic is meant to be a short report, approximately 10 to 15 minutes at the most. And we choose one of those to be what's called the focus topic, the one that is just, we give a little more emphasis to. Okay, the focus topic at that time would be approximately 20 minutes. We tried to balance this out and have approximately three topics in those meetings. So you have one at 20 minutes and maybe the other two at 10 minutes um, for a total of 40. And when we have a study session, we're looking at about a 30 minute presentation and we try to keep it to just that one study session topic. So part of this process is each year um, as a board, we have six months that we have two meetings in. The other months we have one meeting. So in those, in those six months that we have the study sessions, um, we like to spend some time deciding what is most important to the board to learn a little bit more in depth about. So you were asked to come with some things that might be important to you. And on this sheet you see, can you bring that one? Do you have this one on your, yeah. are you able to bring that up? Okay, so you'll see some recommendations from cabinet. So for study session proposed topics, they have marketing and communication, technology and learning with future ready update, um, discipline, bullying and restorative practices, special education, safety, al safety, alternative ed programs, and that would be all alternative ed programs, TK through 12, equity access and inclusion and facilities, and um, if you'd like to jot down a couple more ideas that I had, um, so as we're selecting, and then, and then if we'll see if anybody else has any others. One other um, that I um, think might be a good idea is dashboard indicators and the eight state priorities, just as we don't have necessarily data on all the eight, da on all the dashboard indicators this year, but just to understand what those are and what, um, what, what is measured and what is reported. And then the second one is perhaps budget and finance might be of interest to, especially with new board members. So those are the topics. You can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
um, I just added two, that's 10. We'll have to select six. Does anybody have any others that they would like to add for consideration? Is chronic absenteeism and intervention already in there? Um, it's already a report, I believe, isn't it, Dr. McClay? It is scheduled as a report um, during the year. I'm looking for when. Yeah, uh, March 2nd, or the second meeting in March, I believe, is chronic absenteeism. Yeah, there it is, March 2nd, the second meeting. And the reason after we get past uh, Jan December that the dates just say first or second meeting is because we don't decide on our meeting dates until our organizational meeting in December. So these, the topics that, some of the topics that were pulled and suggested as study topics would, would be typical regular topics that we will have reports on, but they would be shortened unless we want to choose them as ones that would have emphasis. So if nobody has any others, um, our, one, of the, one of our jobs tonight is to select which six we would like to have as study sessions so that um, uh, cabinet can then adjust, yeah. You know, I was just going to add, Mrs. Hinkson, I'm sure folks are seeing this, but of those original eight bullets, and I know Mrs. Hinkson just gave us two additional ones, the last two, equity, access, and inclusion, as well as facilities, those are also down below as suggested uh -huh. workshops. So if you leave those as workshops, you could eliminate discussing them as a study session topic, if that okay. makes sense. Well, they yes, don't need to be in both places. Yes, and I guess that, that's a good point because October 26th is the suggested date for, in October we have what's called a board development workshop. So we pick one topic that we are, have interest in really looking at intensely, and it's a special meeting where that's all we do is focus on that topic. So we need to select that one as well. The March 8th date was added um, as an additional workshop with the suggestion of looking at facilities and our future readiness for, for our facilities, that timing was chosen in, in um, uh, expecting to have results from our master facilities plan study by then. Um, and um, that, that seemed like a good time to be able to get that report back and spend some time actually studying that and having conversation about it. So, um, so at this point, um, are we in agreement to add the additional workshop in March for that purpose? Yes, yeah. okay. Uh, do we have career education as part of uh, technology and learning or would that be that's, separate? I think that's already a re when it's CTE, Sandy? Yes, yeah, CTE is, you, we can add that if you want to add that as a proposed topic. Yes. We have it on the... It's also a, slated for the second meeting in March, but if we want to make it a study session topic, that's great. So we can pull that one out as possible okay. study Thank session you. as well. Okay. All right. So now we have 11 different possible study sessions and one board development workshop to decide on which, which items we're most interested in. And Mrs. Hinkson, did I hear the board agree that on March 8th we would do facilities and future ready? Yes. If that's the case, do you want to remove facilities as a study session and bring it down to 10? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. Thank you. I think that'll give us good time after having the master plan. Well, the October 26th, that's for us to decide, and I really think that's an important one, especially from the standpoint of new board members, is what, what is it that you most feel would benefit you from the board development workshop? The suggestion was equity, access, and inclusion, but maybe you have a, you know, something different in mind. Are we talking about one specific focal point for the March for this March meeting then? For the October board development workshop. Or for the October, I'm yeah. sorry, for the October board. We want one central focused point for that. It's, it's one item that there's a special board meeting that is that's all we do is have a have a um, board development workshop where we really learn in depth about that topic. Well, you know, I would. I, I know I, I can't say that uh, Mr. Skimowitz would echo my my choice on this, but I think communication and the way we market this district has been a continuing, not problem necessarily, but a question, at least on my mind. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the, the way we communicate to parents and the broader community at this point is probably more important now than ever. And 
I would think that that would probably be the number one focus point that we would want to hone in on for that October meeting. So, Mr. Schwartz, Mr. Where, where do you land? I agree. In, in agreement? I'm in agreement. Okay, so the topic for the October 26th board development workshop then will be um, the one that's listed first, marketing and communication. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now we need to select from the remaining nine, and I guess the easiest thing would be maybe to re reduce the three that we feel we would least like to hear a, a s extended study session on during our regular board meetings. Can you give a little information on alternative education programs? That, that's um, not CTE. That's, that's not, well, no, that's not CTE. Alt Ed would be um, uh, our home instead program okay. for K, uh, TK through eight. And then our nine through 12 um, alternative programs that are available, including independent study and Susan Nelson um, programs. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And keep in mind that anything that you cut as a study session, we will make sure is in this calendar as an information item. So it's not that you won't get the information. You just get a, sh you know, it's, a, it's how, how much in depth do you want? Yep. Mr. Finkson, do you want us to give you your top, our top three? Yeah. Um, your t uh, no, the three that you would probably like to not, I don't know, which way do you want to do this? The ones you want to be study session? I feel like I, I think that <laughs> maybe what we're most passionate about. Okay, and then we'll see where we end up. I think up. all of these are important. Okay. So it would be hard to say that three aren't. Uh, all right, would you like to go first? Um, sure. I would take safety. Okay. I would take discipline, bullying, and restorative practices, and special education. Okay. Do what? We're just three. Top three, saying. and then we'll okay. see where we land. Because I was going to say, I'm good with the, the six on the left. I think we get enough information on CTE budget and, and dashboard indicators. But uh, if I were going to go top three, I'd go with special education, safety, and EAI. All right. Mr. Schwartz? Uh, definitely special education. Sorry. Definitely special education, uh, safety, and uh, discipline, bullying, and restorative practices. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lohner? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to echo uh, Mrs. Brosh and uh, Mr. Schwartz. I, I also agree. Special education is right there at the top. Uh, discipline, bullying, uh, and then the safety component, obviously. Okay. And um, I guess it comes back to me. Um, I think um, I'd like to, uh, I, I think for me it would be discipline and bullying, restorative practices, safety, and alt-ed programs. And so we have no votes for dashboard indicators, budget finance, or CTE. So should we just say that those will be the three that we don't cover? Yeah. And we, oh, wait, wait a minute. We had no votes for technology and learning with future ready update either. So those would come in as uh, information. Well, no, we need one more topic for study session. So out of the remaining ones, technology and learning, dashboard indicators, budget, and CTE, I guess, can I get a vote going around on that one? Mrs. Broch, which one? The technology and learning with future ready update, dashboard indicators, and the eight state priorities. Budget, finance, or CTE? Um, I would go with dashboard indi indicators. Okay. Mr. Schoenwitz? Technology. Okay. Sorry. Mr. Schwartz? Uh, technology. Okay. Mr. Lohner? <laughs> I'm going with budget. <laughs> budget. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Cheers. I am the decider here. I think that... Um, I think I'm going to lean on dashboard indicators. So now we're down to, we have two votes, two votes, and one vote. So we have to pick one of these two. No, I wasn't the decider. So we're split decision on technology and learning and dashboard indicators. So maybe if we can turn to Dr. McClay and ask her to give us a little more input on what those, <laughs> fact, what factors we might um, expect to hear in those, and then we can make a final decision between those two. Okay, might I make one other suggestion and then I'm happy sure. to do that if sure. you don't like it. 
I show that um, we had three or four board members wanting discipline, special education, and safety, so those would be for sure. Um, I showed two board members wanting technology and learning and the dashboard indicators. Oh, I so, see what you're saying. So I'm thinking those might be numbers four and five, and then the question becomes for number six, we okay. had one board member each wanting, yep. I'll, I'll, do you see where I'm going? Yes, I okay. do. I'll let you take over. I, I completely see where you're going because we only had one vote on the other exactly. two. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we now have two votes for technology and learning and two for dashboard indicators, so we're gonna go back to the ones we only have one vote on. So um, we have to pick one of these three, is that right, I one? Sh I show three, I show Alt-Ed, EAI, and Budget. Five. Each of we those had one. We need to pick one. one out of those three. Is that correct? Okay, so from Alt-Ed programs, which is what we described, K through, like TK through 12, Equity, access, and inclusion, or budget. We have, to eat, we have to come up with which one there, Mrs. Broch. Um, is would this be in addition to the? No, this is our sixth one. Right. No, I'm, but I'm asking probably Mrs. Lash. Is this going to be in addition to the numerous budget updates that we already get? Exactly. That's so is this going to provide us more information, or would it be better to choose a different category? So I'm happy to provide more in-depth or maybe some background when I do my normal right. um, first interim, second interim. Um, I'm happy to do that. No, because this would this would normally be more um, foundational information on budget and and more into the weeds um, as opposed to the budget updates or reports that we do throughout the year. So in the past, we've gotten deep into like the local control funding formula, the calculations for that, um, historical views, projections, things like that. Okay, so, and I know it's been really about understanding the budget rather than just our current numbers. Right. Um, go ahead and go to Adam. Can I just make one point? Sure. Uh, uh, about that budget portion. I just think, uh, I just think that with such an unforeseen um, amount of students coming back uh, in the fall and being that the hold harmless policies expire at the end of this year, we are gonna be making some pretty critical long-term budget decisions. And I think speaking it only for myself at this point, um, being a first year um, board trustee, the more information I have leaning in to making decisions that are gonna have very, very long-term ramifications with this district with so much uncertainty at the foundation, I think the much better I would feel uh, knowing that information. So that's just my two cents. I would, I would agree with that. I would go, I would go more along with that. And, and typically when we go that in depth, it's a, it's a board workshop, not just a study session. So this was still gonna be fairly brief if it's only 30 minutes. But you know, for me, the other important thing to hear too is looking at some of our um, federal and state relief funds. You know, that's kind of an important topic right now as well. It's a significant um, uh, factor. So anyways, Mrs. Broche. Budget. budget. Mr. Loner, budget. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Miss, where are you at? I'm fine with that. I think we no. have two. No, you're at budget. You want budget or something else? I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with EAI. I think we have plenty okay. of information on budget. All right, uh, and Mr. Schwartz. I really wanted to go uh, through CTE, but I will uh, defer to the majority. There is no majority yet. No, didn't you have three for budget? No, I only have two. Okay. Where are you at? I'm on CTE. But that's not one of the choices because we had two vo votes. Oh, okay. For, we're, I mean, we had one vote for budget, alt-ed, or equity, access, and inclusion. Or I'll go, I'll go with budget if it's that important to some of us. Okay, we have three for budget then. So those are our six topics. Do you have them? Yes, absolutely, thank you. Okay. Budget, okay, there we go. All right, and then on that same sheet, if you look down farther, um, there were some, we just wanna make sure because the board does have to approve 
uh, planning calendar. We just want to make sure it says topics to consider. Mm -hmm. Staff would prefer to provide written updates on these. So in the past, we've had presentations, and I know Mr. Um, Skumwich, you were part of this um, TK through 5 LCAP positions. We went through position by position and heard what those positions entail and, and um, data related to the success of each one of those programs. And we had pre two presentations, one on TK through 5 and one on 6 through, tel th through 12. And so the proposal um, from staff and also on charter schools, those three pre presentations, the proposal was to remove those from our board planning calendar, which means we would not have a presentation during our board meetings, but those items would move to written updates that we would receive. Does anybody have any concerns about that? I do not. I, I don't have any concerns no, about that. No, that's fine. We're good? Okay, so we're good with that. And then the last thing is each year we have an annual curriculum review on one subject and we typically pick a subject that we would like more information on that year and we get a, a more complete report. So last year's um, suggestion was math, but I think it was set aside because of the situation. So the suggestion is to return and discuss math further unless somebody would like a different topic. So is that something we need to decide tonight or can we see how school's going for kids and seeing, you know, maybe we can get some feedback about what we need to dive deeper into what our students are struggling with coming back? It, actually, I think that's a very valid point. We're holding in that month the curriculum review presentation spot. We could revisit in January maybe after first semester data comes in. We, we could um, review at the board's annual organizational meeting too mm -hmm. in, Feb in, in mm -hmm. December. We can just leave it as a TBD because it's not until April, right? It's in the spring for sure. Mm -hmm. Is everybody okay with I, holding on it? Yeah, I, I well, think that would be the thing to do because I, I think we, we don't have the information yet to make that decision. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so the rest of the um, board agenda planning calendar then will be adjusted. Um, what you have on here, basically, for instance, if you look at September, it will show study session one, there's no topic. Study session two, no topic. So those topics will be removed from the month that they're currently in and placed into those study session okay. positions as staff feels best um, where, where it's most appropriate, right? Yeah, we'll and this then the revised version will come back to us for, for final approval. And then what the next step is, is once we establish what presentations happen in what, which month, those get carried over onto the governance yeah, calendar, okay? Some revisions have already been made um, to the governance calendar um, for um, just adjustments by department um, based on annual changes and um, dates um, are estimated in some cases based on what the board makes a decision in December at that workshop. I mean, I, I mean at the, I'm sorry, at the annual organizational meeting, you know, the dates could fluctuate depending on what days we approve for meetings, but it gives us an opportunity early to think about the fact that there are workshops. We plug them in at, you know, the same dates as last year. You know, if it was a Tuesday, it's a day off or whatever. Um, but they can be adjusted in December if we make changes to the board's calendar for next year. Okay. Anything else? Would you like both of those documents brought back in action or consent? I would like them brought back in consent. I think consent's fine. Great, thank you. Okay. All there? Yep, item three. Item number three, proposed changes to board policy 3230 and administrative regulation 3230, federal grant funds with Mrs. Lash. So um, the federal government updated its guidelines for spending of federal funds and the um, process which has to be followed um, depending on the size of the purchase. And so we're just updating our board policy to follow those new guidelines. Thank you. Moving into our action items, we are, sorry. All right, Mrs. Brosha, I'd like to move that we table action item three through five at this time until a future meeting. Can I have a second on that? So moved. Second by Mr. Schwartz, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 
Did we hear Mr. Lohner? Mr. Lohner. Aye. Thank you. Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. So action item number one. I call for a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 2021-22-01 authorizing the district for exemption to the 180-day wait period, government code sections 7522.56. Move. Moved by Mr. Skimmeler. Second. Second by Mr. Schwartz. So we have uh, some turnover in our fiscal services department in the position that oversees attendance. And so um, the, the person that used to oversee attendance has retired um, and God bless her, she is willing to come back and train the replacement that's going to be taking over attendance since it's such a critical part of what we do. Um, however, CalPERS has a rule that says you can't work within your first 180 days of retirement without board action. Uh, the, uh, then it goes to the approval of the um, county superintendent, and then it goes to the approval of CalPERS. So this is step one of getting that, that approval process to bring her back in her first 180 days to provide that training. Any questions? She's just coming back temporarily, correct? Yes, as a substitute. Because uh, she has a restriction on how much she can make it um, within her... Um, Helpers, right? Correct. And as much as we monitor that, the, she will monitor it much even better. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it will be as a substitute. All right. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Action item number two. I call for a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 2021 22 02, incident. Certification of Flood at Temecula Valley High School, May 31st, 2021, Declaration of Emergency. So moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Mr. Skumalance. Does anyone have any questions on this? Or, uh, are we all, we're all aware of what happened at Temecula Valley Unified High School? Yeah. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. We'll now move into our board comments. Does anyone have any comments tonight? So we had missed a negotiation update? We don't have one tonight. Okay. Mr. Loner? Yeah, hey, uh, sorry I'm a voice from beyond tonight. Um, sorry I couldn't be there. Uh, I wanted to first apologize to you all for not being there. Um, my father-in-law is uh, in stage cancer at this moment in time. And being that I am always family first, I felt that my physical presence here, supporting my wife and my kids and my extended family was most important. But I, but I certainly didn't want to miss this meeting. So I'm sorry I had to zoom in, but I hope you can understand that. Um, this has been a pretty tough uh, month. And um, just judging by the comments, um, you know, I, I know that the community is is um, is very involved right now. Um, and so with that said, I just wanted to let you all know that as I promised last month, um, I have been meeting with local and state leaders and upon my return, those meetings obviously will continue. Um, Dr. McClay, I think speaking more to you, my opinion based on what I've heard at least to this point is that none of our state leaders short of, of you know, maybe the governor but that they really want to weigh in because they're really worried about the lack of benchmarks for future policy decisions. Um, and as much as, and, and I know some people mentioned this tonight and I, I wish they were still there. It's, it's unfortunate that they had to leave, but as much as I'd like to travel to Sacramento to speak to the broad group of assembly people and senators, just, just with my own questions, um, I can at this moment. Um, but I assure you that um, I promised those that I've already spoken to and, and those that I will speak to as soon as I get back that, you know, as a fire captain, as a community leader, and most importantly, as a father and a board member, um, you know, I'll continue to speak on behalf and advocate on behalf of this community. So um, whatever that means to each individual person, um, that's, that's what I have to say for the night. Thank you. Are there any other board comments tonight? 
Um, I'd just like to comment on the um, activities of tonight. Uh, I understand there's a lot of passion and a lot of uh, upset in the community. I understand it. I, I'm a parent. I'm a grandparent. I have children in school, and I understand the issues that they've gone through and the issues that this community's gone through. And uh, I just hope uh, in the end we come together to find a good solution for everyone, especially for our children, who are the most important things in our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just start by giving my best to Mr. Lohner. That's the first I heard about what, what's going on with you, and I, I hope everything goes well, and I think you made the right decision. Um, I think this was a, a yeah, a, lo a long night. I think we've talked quite a bit about kind of looking back and, and the path to get where we are, and um, I know when I talk to my kids, they're, they're thrilled that school's starting in a few weeks, and um, I wish we could have everyone um, enthusiastic and thrilled to get back, um, but I understand everyone's circumstance and everyone's opinion is, might, might be keeping that from happening right now. But as we know, everything changes and, and hopefully we get progress going forward and we get to a spot where, um, I guess instead of feeling like we're on different teams, right? I mean, I have three kids in the district. We're all, we're all so kind of um, committed to finding what side we're on as opposed to working towards understanding, right? And supporting one another and uh, learning, right? Learning where someone's coming from, their perspective. Um, I've said it before up here. I think empathy is a huge, a huge um, missing piece that we need to find uh, a little bit more aggressively as we get going uh, into the fall. Uh, but like I said, we're excited um, that school is coming back and that our kids can play dodgeball, like you said. I think that's a, an important thing. Uh, thank you. Mrs. Hinkson? At this point, I'd just be repeating what others have said. So. Um, I, I don't really have anything to add to that. I agree with 100% with what Mr. Skumitz was saying is that, you know, over the course of the last 18 months, we have done a lot of listening. Um, we've had to do a lot of, um, boy, uh, there's been a lot of uh, information that's come from the state, a lot of things that have changed day to day, week to week, month to month. Um, the pandemic has, there's been an ebb and flow of outbreaks and times that are better. And I can remember sitting here a few months ago um, with uh, in board comments saying that I felt very hopeful that we would start the year, full, everyone back full time, and that things would be returning to normal. And, and, and now I guess there's a new concern with the Delta virus and, and um, you know, new masking requirements in LA County and um, increased infections and, and uh, case rates and everything. So, um, you know, we, we, I think we still have a little bit of road to travel and um, I think that it's important that we do that together and that we listen to everyone because we, this has been a very polarizing thing, not just in our district, but in the state and across the country. And um, the most important thing is that we understand everybody's point of view, and I can just tell you from reading hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails over the last year that f families are dealing with a lot of different things, whether it's a child who is immunocompromised, who is ill in some way or another, who would also like to come back to school and wants to feel protected, or those of us who, you know, um, everyone wants things back to normal as quickly as possible. Um, so, you know, the, the whole thing is, is um, if I had a magic wand, I'd wave it and say there was no pandemic. And I wish I could do that. Um, that's not, um, you know, that's something that's not something we could control. The only thing we can do is react the best we can. And I just really want to give kudos to the hard work of every single person in this district and all, all of the heartfelt, um, I don't know, um, work that they have done trying to do the best we can to educate students in this environment, provide options, 
bring them back with the least amount of restrictions we can under the mandates that we're in. Um, think about what's best for people and always having in mind what's best for our students. And when the question's asked, do we have children? I don't, I mean, I've had children come through our schools. I have two grandchildren who will be coming back to school. And um, if you don't know, I was a teacher in this district since 1990. So I'm very vested. I care a lot. I wouldn't be here right now after I retired serving a second term on the school board if I didn't care about our kids, about our education, and about our community. And it's a little bit hurtful to have people think that you don't care. And, um, you know, that, that I take that very personally. And um, I didn't run for school board for any power I ran for because I care about our education system. I left, you know, when I retired, I said, I want to make a difference. I've spent 30 years teaching in Temecula, or not 30, I'm 30 years in Temecula now in education, but I taught here for over 24 years. And I felt like I, I, I could make a difference, and there were things that I wanted to um, have an impact on. So um, anyways, I, I just, I really have to echo what Mr. Skumowitz is saying is that as strongly as one person feels about something, the next person has another strong opinion. We all have had so much trauma in our lives in the last year and a half that we need to go back to that grace that Dr. McClay was talking about and treat each other that way. And we will all come out of this doing the very best that we can because that's the only thing that everyone sitting up here cares about is doing the best that we can for the students in this district with, with whatever is in our power to do, okay? And I'll tell you that sitting as, as a um, board, as a delegate to the state California School, board, California School Boards Association, I sit as a delegate on that assembly and we meet regularly with our legislators and CSBA is extremely active in having those discussions at the state level. And, um, you know, so we, we are not silent. We do have a voice. And we are taking our messages of what's going on in our district, how things are evolving, and the help we need from our state in helping to clarify messages and, um, you know, and serve our, serve our community. So. Um, you know, tonight is not easy on us, and trust me when I tell you that this entire year and a half has not been easy on us. Um, every single one of us has had many, many sleepless nights, much anxiety about the decisions that we're faced with, and we truly have in our heart to do the best for our students. Thank you, Mrs. Hankson. I am not going to echo all of that, although I agree with all of you. Um, I do want to say, Mr. Leonard, I'm glad we were able to make this work so that you're here with us, and my heart goes out to you and Jen tonight. I can't imagine. Um, please give your family my love, and I'll pass my time over to Dr. McClay. And I'll be brief. I think you've heard a lot from me this evening, and everybody's really, really tired, so stay safe, and thank you for your continued service. It's not easy. Future agenda items, staff will present information on the following agenda items for the meeting on August 17th, 2021, athletic and co-curricular data, opening school report, staff development annual review, and superintendent evaluations goals and objectives in closed session. We have no reason to move into closed session. Dr. McLean, did we wanna move back to closed? The next regular session, open session, business meeting of the Governing Board of Education is scheduled for August 17th, 2021. This meeting is a 